Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 35th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Cheryl Holland. Cheryl is the founder of Abacus Planning Group, a private wealth management firm located in Columbia, South Carolina, that manages more than $1 billion of assets under management for just over 200 affluent clients. What's fascinating about Cheryl's firm, though, is the way that she has systematized the processes of the firm in in a way that actually helps them to be even more high-touch and customized for their clients, from automating workflows, tasks, and reminders of client needs to building a templated meeting agenda for every client meeting that covers check-ins, celebrations, investments, financial planning, administrative tasks, to refining an investment process around modern portfolios using DFA funds, Cheryl's firm has invested heavily in systematizing the business and invested heavily into customizing Salesforce as their CRM to facilitate the process. In this episode, Cheryl shares how her firm structures its blended AUM plus planning fee structure, why Abacus sets a minimum fee rather than an asset minimum in deciding which new clients to work with, why the firm decided to make a shift towards focusing on a niche of closely held family businesses after already growing successfully for nearly 20 years, and how the firm markets today with a combination of COI referrals, client referrals, and national board volunteerism to drive its growth. In addition, we also talk about Abacus's approach to reinvesting into its team. As Cheryl puts it, you can't grow your firm if your people aren't growing. With everything from sending employees out to conferences, bringing in psychologists to teach active listening and empathy skills, management training classes for emerging leaders of the firm, including Cheryl herself, and how every operations and administrative team member at Abacus has a chance to take the registered paraplanner course and begin advancing themselves in the firm. And be certain to listen to the end when Cheryl shares the two key business books that she reads every year to advance the firm, how she decides when it's time to make a change and evolve her role in the business, and her advice to young women who are trying to grow their own advisory careers and manage all the competing demands of work, home, and family. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Cheryl Holland. Welcome, Cheryl Holland, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Michael, good morning and thank you. I'm I'm excited to have you on the podcast. I was actually trying to figure out how how long we've known each other. I'm I'm not even quite sure how far back it goes. I think it's like ten or twelve years now, maybe. I think on the long end of twelve, Michael. Yeah, yeah. And I can't even remember why I was in in town, but I was. I was coming through Columbia, South Carolina, where you guys are based, and you were kind enough to invite me to your office. And you have this beautifully designed office. I know you guys like made and created and designed yourself with the, with this really cool space and and like different types of client conference rooms. So there's a really formal conference room for the clients that tend to be, shall we say, a, a little more formal. And there's a more casual conference room with like low tables and comfy chairs for clients that are a little bit more casual. And like, th- there were just so many things that were clear were, were sort of deliberate, intentional design elements of your firm that I had never seen any other advisory firm do before that it 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 left me just fascinated with what you're building there in, in your business. Michael, I think that's a fascinating comment. Many of the listeners may not know I'm married to an architect. And so the genesis of the building was, I thought to myself, I'm really good at my human capital and evolving it and monetizing it and growing it. And he's really good at his human capital. We had never used our human capital together, except to have a child, I guess you could say. (laughs) And I begged him to do a building for me. And he finally gave in and he found this building and it was really a pig's ear that he could turn into a silk purse in my mind. And with the work of our wealth psychologist, he designed a beautiful space for clients that incorporated learning environment elements, collaborative workspace elements, confidential space for intimate meetings, all the things that we were hoping to achieve at the time, and a space for 
growing our art collection, which is something that's important to Doug and I too, and helps brand us in our community. So the elements of the physical building are part of our brand. People who don't know us know the building. And we try to expand that 2500 Divine, which is our address, look into the implementation of our website so that they are, every experience you have of Abacus has a similar feel of collaboration, inclusiveness, flatness in terms of hierarchy, all the ways that we operate should be communicated to you via everything we do, our space, our website, how we answer the phone, et cetera. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about more on the, on the podcast, but you, you just, you create things in your business with a very unique level of focus and intent about how you craft, you know, the way your space looks, the way your brand looks. I know you spend a lot of time on just developing your people and developing your culture. And, and just, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. Cause I, I don't see that very often in our advisory industry where, where firms are created with that kind of sort of focus on intentional design of the business itself. But I, you know, maybe, maybe as a starting point, can you just Share with us a little about the firm. You know, what What is Abacus Planning Group as it exists today? We're about 24 team members. The audience might find it interesting that we have five permanent virtual team members. And we can talk about that a little bit later. We have about a billion dollars under management, discretionary management on behalf of our clients. Although we think of money management as an area of excellence, but a subset to the broader holistic financial planning that we do on behalf of clients. We have about 225 clients and our team members who number about 24 have a variety of designations. I think we have something in the neighborhood of 13 certified financial planners, CPA, enrolled agents, JDs. And what I'm particularly proud of is we have five registered paraplanners. So everyone who works on the operations team comes onto Abacus and grabs right away this idea of growing your human capital, improving your skill set, and they, early in their careers, typically get their registered pair of planners, which I think makes us a stronger institution on behalf of our clients. So your your operation stuff, so this would be like client administration, account exactly. opening, paperwork, that kind of stuff, exactly. go into a registered pair of planner program. They do. Each and where, and where, is, where is that or who is that through? That's a great question. I think they do that through the CFP. College, College for Financial Planning. That's exactly right. Okay. There's a, there's a program you can go. If you Google registered paraplanner, it'll pop right up with the coursework that you need to okay. take and the test that you do. And then they have to do continuing education and gives them a better understanding of what the planners in the office are doing. Not quite as strong of a knowledge of what the investment advisors are doing, but the investment advisors do some continuing education for them to help them understand what they're doing on a day-to-day basis. And we'll put a link out to the registered paraplanner program in the in the show notes as well, if anyone's curious. So this is episode 35. So if you go to kitsis.com slash 35 and, and scroll down a little, you can see the resources mentioned in the episode and we'll, we'll include a link there for people who are curious. So I'm just kind of doing the rough math here, a billion dollars under management, 225 clients. So you're, you're, your typical client is is four four and a half million dollars. Does that sound about right? That's true. Although the the range is quite broad because we have our legacy clients. You've got, you know, grandma comes on board with the businessman who sold his business. So yeah, we have a range. Yeah. Do you do you operate with minimums at this point? Like, is there a certain type of client that you have to be to come on board with Abacus at this point? I would answer that in two ways. One is we have a fee minimum, and so our fee minimum is $24,000, and we tell people if you have X amount of assets and X complexity, this is a good value. If you have less than that or we don't think you're complex enough to get enough value, we'll make referrals to other planners in the region, or sometimes those individuals come on anyway because this is where they want to be. So that's how we've established our minimum. And that's a fee minimum, and then ultimately there's some kind of AUM fee schedule if you're if you're over that number, or or are all of yes. your fees just flat dollar amount fees? So it's a combination of a flat fee 
and an AUM fee. So every client pays a flat, what we call financial planning fee, but it's a fee that gets at the complexity of the clients, not just the investments that we're managing on our behalf. And the second gate I would say, Michael, is that we are focused primarily on families with shared assets, typically a closely held business, but sometimes real estate, sometimes timber holdings. And so we will take other clients, but we want people to know out of the gate that's where we focus our time and energy on our technical development. And what's a typical breakdown of how you do fees between financial planning fees and and AUM fees. Mm-hmm. So our financial planning fees range from six thousand to one hundred twenty five thousand, knowing that not that many people fall in the top right, range. But you, 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 and then you get complex enough, you can get that's right. Complex, I guess, our right. AUM fees run from point six to point two five. Okay, so you're you're I mean, relative to. I think what most advisors charge, you're 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 much lower on the AUM fee with with a pretty hefty planning fee. Exactly. And that's why we really communicating to clients to come here, they they need to have some need on the planning side. We don't take we have some clients who've become invested only because they're eighty two and they've been here forever and we can't think up anything to do on their behalf. But almost everybody else has ongoing routine, tax, estate. Gift, charitable gifting, challenge, business challenges that they need our assistance. So if someone comes to you with $3 million of assets, that's a 60 basis point fee is $18,000. And then a minimum planning fee is $6,000. So like if I'm, if I'm around 3 million of assets, I'm probably getting pretty close to your, where your fee, where your fee schedule matches up with your fee minimum. Exactly. And where you can, if you're not that complicated, you would be at 6,000 and you would, this would be a value. I think in pricing. So why why the structure that way? I mean, why not just we have a three million dollar minimum as opposed to a twenty four thousand dollar fee minimum? I think that's a good question. And I think it has to do with how many people who've come in at that fee at lower assets under management. Probably fifteen percent of our clients at some point in time were lower than that and then grew into that fee over time. But we didn't have the bandwidth to take them on, given where we were in the growth cycle at certain points in time, to lower the fee. And they want to be here anyway. Okay. So you know, they, maybe they've got a lot of financial planning complexity and they just say like, hey, I know like the AUM portion of my fee is whatever, half of this or less, but – I value the planning work that you do. So if we want to pretend I'm paying 12,000 of AUM and 12,000 of planning fees, that's fine because I think your planning fees are worth it to get to your 24,000 minimum because I want to work with you. And sometimes it's family members who are have family members here or partners who have partners here. So they already have transparency into what happens. And so if you're doing a lot of work with families with shared assets, do you, do you, like, do you set up this fee structure and servicing for the the family in the aggregate? Like, your family has a twenty four thousand dollars fee minimum, or is it like, no, 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 my, we work with mom and dad, and here's their fee structure, and you know, if the if the kids want to work with us, they've they've got to they got to pay their own fee for their own way for their own stuff. It's almost always the second. Occasionally, it's the first. But for one thing, we want a different client advisory agreement with each individual for confidentiality. Chinese wall so that each person feels safe and that we are an advocate for them. So the challenge you can imagine in that setup is surfacing all the conflicts of interest at the right time. Yep. And so, yeah, you know, I, I, I got to ask like, what, what do you do for a $24,000? <laughs> That's a good sized amount of, Planning fee dollars. Like, what, what do I, if I'm a prospective client and I ask you, like, what, so what exactly do I get for my $24,000 to Abacus? You know, you'd be surprised how rarely people actually ask that. <laughs> I wish people asked it more often because I worry when they walk out the door, how are they making a good decision? Because I think first and foremost, what we're really doing as advisors is helping make people make good choices good decisions. It's not just about good decisions in the markets, but 
a mortgage or not a mortgage, you know, is it time to gift to your children or not? And how do you do the education, the financial skills from the time they're six until they're 30? So when they are getting a large inheritance, they're ready for that. We do all the classic, you know, tax planning that most advisors do. We're very heavily involved in the estate planning. We go with clients to the attorney. We help them select one. You and I know then on the back end, it's execution, getting the beneficiary designations correct, the retiling of the revocable trust, all those general partnership interests. But for many clients, they have a closely held business. So we may be having annual meetings with the accountant too to do year-end tax planning. We've got a piece of puzzle. The CPA has a piece of the puzzle. Let's put that together so that the strategies are appropriate year after year after year and have a multi-year plan for that particular, we we oftentimes manage small 401ks for the client where we wouldn't be profitable on that, but they need to have it for their organization. We do the education. So it's a, it's a customized, you know, pick from the menu that we do for each client. But as you mentioned earlier, we're highly process driven. So our goal is to customize what typically would be a mass produced product so that we can serve a higher clientele and be a very efficient internally. We have family meetings for every client. So if you're just finished your estate plan and you have adult children, we come in and we go through the plan with them, allow them to ask questions. And the things that come up are never who gets what. That's rare. It comes up occasionally. But it's more, hey, dad, you know, what are all those binders over your desk and do I need to worry about those? Mom, you know, You've always told me you don't want to go to a nursing home, but what if that happens? How do we talk about What can we talk now about that eventuality? So that's very valuable to people, having family communication. Interesting. And so between family meetings and, and estate planning meetings and year and tax planning meetings, and I presume at some point maybe clients want to know what's going on with that portfolio you happen to be helping out with. I mean, how how often do you meet with clients on an ongoing basis? Well, I would say most clients are in a couple of times a year. People go th- – that's the interesting thing about financial advising is people go through cycles and they may not need you at all for two years. And then last week we got an email from a client and said, we're in Peru, we lost our green cards – can you help my daughter figure out what to do so we can get home and do surgery Monday morning? <laughs> and those are the kinds of things your clients actually call you about. We were the we were the we were we thought it was a fish for getting money. Like, yeah, like this this is exactly <laughs> exactly the story how fake wire fraud transfer exactly requests begin. But they truly did need that assistance. And we were we were first call. And so that's not an unusual story that we share, you know, in our weekly staff meetings of, you know, we're in a helping profession. Yes, we're in a expertise profession. People trust us to make sure that they're getting on the boat, Noah's Ark, right? And that at the end of the 40 days that we may go through in the future, they're going to land on dry land and we're going to have helped them do that. But that's not the only thing they're looking for, just portfolio. In fact, I will tell you, Michael, we've gone to a new system saying, would you like the headlines for your portfolio or would you like the full story? And I bet 80% of our clients say, just give me the two paragraphs or just give me the headlines. I trust you all. So you, you literally ask them that that yes. question and yes. like write it down in a CRM or something like this. This is a headlines client. We check in every time because people can change depending on, right, your beautiful work around risk tolerance, risk perception, right, <laughs> risk yes. capacity. So risk perception does change yep. for some people. But I would encourage clients, I mean, I would encourage listeners to try it and see how often the individual really doesn't want to be talked to about their portfolio. There are clients who love that and we are prepared for that. But checking in has been a real surprise to us. Yeah. I mean, the flip side, I know for at least some firms, if they're still trying to get deeper on their planning process, there's there's actually kind of a fear that comes from asking clients that question. Because if they if they say, I just want the headlines, you, you may not actually have enough things to talk about for the remainder of the, the one hour meeting that just got scheduled with them. You know, like, I mean, there's sort of a dynamic. It could be, beware asking clients more planning questions. Because you have to actually be ready to do the work when they answer with needs and problems. 
because the follow-up to that is, well, I'm curious about what other questions you may have for us today. Yeah. And is that actually part of how you run meetings? Like, do you set agendas that, that sort of go through all of these different pieces or just kind of start off every meeting with, hey, so we got some investment stuff and we can do headlines or details, anything else you want to talk about and, and just kind of go from there? Well, you won't be surprised that we have a big template agenda <laughs> that we call down based on the client's needs for that meeting and send to them in advance for input so that they're co-creating the agenda with us. And then we prepare accordingly for the meeting. I think two things I would add that you mentioned that were so interesting is learning meeting management skills is a skill that I think you oftentimes have to help your other team members develop so that you are having an hour meeting rather than a two-hour meeting. <laughs> so I think that's an interesting point. And the second reason we're asking open-ended questions is we deeply believe that if we're superior listeners, then we will always be in a position to grow as a business. So I'm just curious for one more minute on this this kind of agendas mm -hmm. structure. So what what do you well, I guess two questions. What what kinds of things are actually on the agenda or maybe on the on the giant template agenda before it, it narrows down? And What's the actual process for sending it to, to clients? Like how far in advance do you send it? How much back and forth do you have about the agenda beforehand? Like would you, do you actually physically print it then when it's meeting time? I mean, just what is, what is that agenda process Michael, look like? you know me. We use iPads in the meetings. <laughs> Unless the client has asked for paper. Um, okay. So we're actually in the transition of automating so much of this, but – the, the, it's, the, it breaks into four basic chunks, sort of an update where we would say, you know, check in on goals, check in on family and health and business. And then we have a celebration section because we just love to celebrate. We always love to ask the clients, what can we celebrate? We then have a section on financial planning, a section on investments, and a, an administrative section that, you know, we might have to do some paperwork or something that needs to be taken care of at the detail level, but not the discussion, decision-making level. And that has components under it that you can well imagine what they might look like. And depending yep. on what the client wants to do, we sort of move that around. So some of the things we're starting to do is, as we have automation, is that this is a small example, but we always like to give clients whose child is turning driving age. And quite frankly, this is sad in South Carolina, it's 15. So when a client's child turns 15, there's an automated to-do that says add I promise to the agenda, which is a, I think it's a st one of the insurance company's document that you re go through with your child over all the issues that they promise to do now that they're beginning to drive. It's a wonderful document if you have children that age or clients who have children that age. And so, you know, who wants to research as the kid 15? So the, having that automated, that, then it will automate. We're not at this stage yet, but it'll automatically go onto the agenda for the client who turns has children that age. So that's just a tiny example, but you have all these high touch things like that that the client appreciates. If you can do something like that at every meeting, based on age, stage of life, cycle of marriage, the griefs, you know, process of grieving, any transition is very powerful and showing the client that we actually do care about them. And yet allowing that to be a process so everyone's getting a consistent experience across the firm. Well, I think it's just that's an interesting structure to the the agenda of kind of this check-ins, celebrations, financial planning, investments, administrative. Like that's it's a lot of stuff on an agenda. It can be. I mean, but we usually the meetings are usually somewhere around an hour and fifteen minutes and run properly. And obviously for newer clients, there's gonna be more on there. We go through a financial crisis. We're not going to talk a lot about the financial planning unless clients want to know, did you update my cash flow planning? And when there's a big tax reform act, we spend less time on investments. Let, let me, one of, and I bet many people in the listening to us do this, but each client has four team members. They have a lead advisor, they have an investment advisor, and they have a financial advisor and a, an operations person. So, I'm not in there the whole time as the big talking head if I'm the lead advisor. So that makes it shorter too. It makes it more interesting for the client. 
because they have interaction with multiple people. So lead, lead advisor, investments, financial planning, I guess like a, like a pair of planner, associate planner, support kind of person, and, and then operations. Okay. And, and so how many, how many of those teams do you have across 24 team members? Yeah. So we're sort of we're unusual and we probably over time will morph into a more siloed approach. But right now, for two reasons, we have cross teams. So I, it's rare for me to work with the same team members for more than 10 clients. If I, if I had 40 clients, it would be rare to have the exact team for, for more than 10 clients. We do that. We're such a young organization. We do that for training so that our young people are getting exposure to various senior planners. We do that so it would be very difficult for a team to lift off and go out on its own because they wouldn't be able to take much with them unless, you know, the entire firm left, which is always a possibility. And yet at this, so we have, we rediscuss this about every two years and say, should we silo? And the young people typically end up saying, no, we actually like having the variety of working with different planners and different investment advisors. Because from the, from, from the training perspective, it gives them a wider variety of, of learning opportunities in essence. And it also keeps irritation level low, I think, because we're a very direct feedback organization and people know where they stand in terms of where they're strong and where they're weak. But it also allows you to appreciate the gifts of everyone in the organization. So if you're only working with one person, it might be that their gifts begin to be, like for me example, right? I might be very good in client meetings, but I can also create a lot of chaos and I run from one meeting to the next experience and I'm out of town and that could really drown somebody out in terms of energy and capacity and tolerance. But if they're with me just once in a while, it's a lot of fun. So, so, so you, ha you have rotating teams to, to temper everyone's exposure to you. Right. <laughs> and also, in the, and really the primary motivation that was the beginning is, you know, Richie Lee, one of the founders of our profession, once said to me, Joe, you know, you can jump the gender fence and you can jump the age fence, but not everyone can do that. And so we do very carefully craft who we think will be the ideal fit for each client. And that is going to be very different. So of, of 24 team members in total, how, how does this break down into the different areas? Like how many folks are lead advisors? How many are, are in investments? How many are operations? How many are in those financial planning support roles? So we have four on the investment team and Two of those are completing, well, one's completed their CFA, one is completing his CFA, one's a CFP, and the other is starting in a CFA. So the investment team has a half of a fifth person who's part-time. And then on the operations time, we have a full-time dedicated chief operating officer. We have a full-time office manager who has expertise in human resources, which is a wonderful gift to us. And mm. then we have four people who are on the client service administrative team, and everyone else is a on the financial advising team, whether they're new to the system or not. It's uh, upwards of half the total headcount are, are, uh, and are so, on the planning side. Absolutely. So that tells you something about where we put our resources and how we service our clients. And as you know, the investment side tends to be more scalable. Yep. And we have been, we were dimensional fund advisors in, Gosh, 19, even before I started, came out over and started Abacus. So that's allowed us some efficiencies in how we think about the world. So your, your investment portfolio process is, is kind of DFA driven model, model portfolio. Centered. It's not exclusive. Yes. Okay. Okay. And, and so of the more than a dozen on the planning side, is there a breakdown, like how many of those are lead advisors and how many of those are in, in So they're uh, in stages. There are, there are five who are firmly in the lead advisor side. There are others who are in transition and are taking over responsibility for that for clients with less complexity. And 
how do you set – I think I'm just curious how you set some of those staffing levels. I mean I, I spent a lot of time looking – well, in, in terms of our advisory firm, you know, in industry benchmarking studies and you know, you're at – a dozen on the planning side with 225 clients. So, I mean, you're at, you're at 11 to 12 clients per advisory staff when a lot of firm staff 40 or 50. Well, you have to remember that three of our people are brand new out of school. And okay. so not so- – So there's so some folks are still kind of gearing up. They certainly aren't at the – Right, manage multi-million dollar client relationships. No. and and yet. so we are staff for growth. Part of that, you know, we learned a long time ago that being in Columbia, South Carolina, we kind of had to hire three people out of college or at the sort of the beginning of their career, knowing that given place in life, engagement, children, aging family members that probably one was going to actually stay here over the long term, even if they were delighted to be here and had to leave for other reasons. And attracting professionals at a later stage in life, it's a smaller community. It's a little tougher for us to do that. So we've just taken what we have in our environment to be successful and running with it, which also has led us to do so much on the developmental side because we tend to attract, we tend to have younger team members or people who are coming to us with very little expertise in financial planning. So we needed to do a lot of intentionality around growing our team members. We would do that anyway because it's a lot of fun. It's a joy. It's important. You can't grow your firm if your people aren't growing. But that's where we kind of began to realize we have to bring a lot of resources to bear. I, I find it striking that you know, there, there's been tons of discussion in our industry around the challenges of hiring young people and millennials and 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 getting them to, to stick in your advisory firm and and I, I have to admit like you it, it felt almost nonchalant for you to point out that when you hire three millennials out of college, you're assuming only one of them is likely gonna end out staying in in the long run. Like that's just that's a I don't know, there's an interesting mentality shift there that you seem to be assuming two thirds of them won't work out and you're fine with that. Well, I'm not, I don't know that I've, I always feel sad when anybody leaves and I'm not sure it not work out, but I would say, and let me tell you the epiphany. So we had extremely talented intern and her parents were in the financial planning industry. And I knew that ultimately if she hired her, she would move on to work for them. And so we made the decision not to give her an offer. And afterwards, I thought that was one of the stupidest decisions we've ever made. If we had had her for two years, it would have been a brilliant two years. And the gift she would have given us and the energy and the hard work she would have brought to bear would have been well worth the salary and the energy we would have put into her. So that was a shift in my mind from to this position. Now, I don't want to say it's not difficult to train people at the time, but you have to face the reality and then have positive energy on how you're going to solve that particular challenge. Well, I, I, I think you make a good point that, you know, I, I find a lot of firms are anxious about hiring younger advisors for fear that they're going to spend time training them. And the advisor is going to move on. And, and, and there's sort of no acknowledgement of, yeah, but they're going to do work for you in the meantime. Like, they're still going to hopefully at least be, be a good employee and and get things done and contribute to the firm and like it's 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 okay that not everybody that is working in your firm is going to be there for the next 30 years as long as you're paying them a reasonable compensation and they're and they're doing reasonable work that contributes to the value of the firm absolutely and also for someone who's been doing their work for 10 or 15 years the kind of work those young men and women do, some of it is not work that they need to be doing or want to do or could experience burnout if they were still doing it. So are, are there dynamics then that you find that are different in hiring and working with millennial advisors as, as you bring them into the firm? So you've been you've been doing this for a number of years. You've hired a lot of people over the years. I mean, do, do, as someone that's 
actually hired and developed a lot of young talent. Like, do do you see a lot of the the issues in practice that tend to be talked about in the media of of hiring and training and developing and retaining young advisors? I have to say no, Michael. I I, I am. I think the way I think about it is that being a millennial or a baby boomer or a Gen X is one part of who you are, perhaps, but you're also male or female, you may have a specific race or cultural or ethnicity background, your family of origin, the region of the country you grew up, you know, your spiritual upbringing. All of those things are also factors, and so that's just one piece, and it just doesn't appear to us as an organization to be a dominant piece. I mean, we have one millennial who's already a shareholder. We've made an offer to four additional young members of our team, three of whom are millennials. So that's just not been my experience. Interesting. I mean, is there anything you attribute that gap to? Like what everybody seems to say about millennial advisors that you don't find in practice with millennial advisors? Well, I'm, I guess some of it may be true, but maybe those are issues that just don't disrupt or challenge the organization. And I think if when I was 22, <laughs> I can't imagine what the silent generation felt about the youngest of the baby boomers. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there is an interesting <laughs> dynamic there. Yeah, I think about that- World War II, and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to Europe for the summer. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I, you know, yeah, you know, there is to me a some amusement. Like you, you, if you look back at what was written about the boomer generation in the 60s and the 70s when they were 20 somethings entering the workforce like it was it wasn't it wasn't very complimentary at the time either I'm like, sure that's I think as a woman at that young age you know boy I had that book dress for success and that I still keep on my shelf so I took work mm-hmm. highly seriously and I took having a career as a woman who knew she wanted to have a family and there would be challenges very seriously. And there wasn't many role models to look up to. So if this next generation, the next two generations have different ways of thinking, they've just been born and come into their own at a different moment in time. And so they have different options. We had, I had all of our summer interns over for dinner at my house a couple of weeks ago. The thing that popped into my mind that was so fascinating, I asked them all what was on their bucket list. And Mm. all of them talked about world travel and all of them talked about extended stay in a culture that was not their own. And these are kids from, you know, all over the country, all over, and, and some of them from small towns, some of them from big cities. And that was not something that my generation would have said. And I was like, wow, I love that. Go for it. So for the, the rest of the infrastructure of the firm, what do you guys build on from the technology end? So classically, most firms have kind of three core pieces of technology, some kind of CRM, some kind of portfolio accounting, and, and some kind of financial planning software. So what's what's the technology infrastructure look like at, at Abacus? So do you know, we technology is so core what we do. Although these three pieces probably don't speak to that except the CRM. We use Salesforce. Okay. We've highly customized it, and that's where all of our automation and and efficiencies are coming now. And we've we've had a CRM for, you know, 15 years of our existence almost, and the data we have in it is a huge competitive advantage, in my opinion, and the way we can manipulate and do reports and get, you know, and it, and is that why you picked Salesforce over so we, Juncture, Red Tail? Yeah, we were others? in Sales Logics way before any of those existed, really, to any degree. And so we decided to go with Salesforce. So we've been delighted. And we have barely scratched the surface of what we'll be able to do with the program. And we collaborate with another firm on this. I was going to ask, like, how do you do your customizing and building automations like that's 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 not inexpensive to adapt salesforce well i have to say for one we collaborate with the joyce Payne partners michael joyce's firm in richmond virginia and harrisburg pennsylvania and 
we have a gift. One reason we've been able to do this, we have a team member, Scotty Scott, who is on our investment advisory team, but he is a brilliant virtuoso in these areas. So yes, we outsource to a group when we first moved over, but the automation and customization that we do now, he can do a tremendous amount of it. Then we outsource as a the two firms, what we both want to do together. But the cost isn't that much for what we're getting in return in terms of scaling and automation. So who, who did you outsource to initially oh, as you were gosh, building this? Oh, gosh, they've changed their name so many times. I think we were – I think it's Red. Oh, I don't – I'm see, this is good news. I'm so far away from those decisions now. Yeah. I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually good. <laughs> so I'm I'm curious what this – collaboration structure it looks like so so like they they uh, they have their version of salesforce and you have your version of salesforce it's just when you make changes you cha- you make changes to some template that both of you use like that kind of structure or are you literally sharing a salesforce license so originally there were three of us the family firm mary malgoish firm before mary retired and we, you got to remember we began all those years ago and so we did make group decisions and it was very effective wisdom the crowds and now there's a team between the two firms that collaborates and they make decisions and then we prioritize at the leadership level between the two firms and then they outsource for execution so we have a plan we had a three-year plan usually we've moved that probably down to a two-year plan now Hmm. and yes they may not we may not use everything they do we may not use everything we do but we always split the costs okay and it's so much stronger because you've got a broader set of brains and different ways of looking at things so you can call, you know. And and what kinds of changes are you making? Like I feel for, for a lot of us, maybe we're so not used to adapting our CRM that way. It's hard to even imagine what, what you would do and adapt your CRM to do. Like what, what kinds of changes or automations or customizations are, are you – putting in place that helps your efficiency? So all the checklists that we have, most of them now auto-populate based on a trigger point. It might be a date. It might be an age. It might be entering the date that we receive a tax return. These are like planning checklists or or operational checklists? So for example, a very simple one is a tax return comes in the door, it gets scanned, The person in charge of this enters the date we receive the tax return on a panel, and then a whole process populates. A Mm to-do, an automatic email to the client draft is set up. The checklist for the tax return is set up. So all of those, that's not many steps, but that simplifies so much work for so many clients, for so many of the team members. All things like birthdays, you know, so the birthday card report and the anniversary report, simple things that I'm sure other CRMs are doing, all the way to running our, you know, getting our, we only send out investment reports semi-annually and then we do to the virtual vaults monthly. All of that is also automated through WorldOcs and our CRM. Okay. With help from Trumpet, who, you know, excels in this area. Okay. So you work with Joe Day at Trumpet mm-hmm. as well? Absolutely. Okay. And so what about the rest of the the technology infrastructure? So you're a very... Salesforce centric firm, clearly. And we are in Portfolio Center, although the operations team has just written the leadership team a memo about moving to Tamarack. So that is probably in the works. And then we, we've we always used Golden Years. Uh, the Money Tree product. We've used the Money Tree product. And I tell you why we have been, we are looking at the other options. We have been slow to move only because our clients are complex. And we have such technical knowledge around how that box, black box works and how to enter data to get, you know, accurate, predictable. One of the things that's always been popular, I know, for users, money trees, golden years is, is you know, it's, it's flexible enough. You can pretty much, you can cram in any cash flow at any point you want. If you've got complex client situations, you're trying to manage or, or model and they're particularly good in that they give you a very detailed audit trail of exactly. where where numbers come from. So if you want to print out all the supporting pages, like you you can manually recreate every single calculation in their software. Not not that exactly. most people would want to, but it's really nice to know that you can 
actually validate every number because unfortunately for a lot of other planning software, sometimes numbers come out and you, you ask where that number comes from and nobody can actually show you where that number comes from. Like it really is a black box. You're exactly right, Michael. And our head of financial planning, Alex Chessain, is the guru of all of that. And I, I mean, ultimately, we will probably make a transition too, but that's a tough one for us because of the complex nature of our clients. I mean, we might be putting in an oil and gas holding and, you know, cattle and rental real estate and pension and just just many moving parts. So given that and, and kind of the depth that you have in the software, what what would drive a change at all? Like why... Why do you feel this need or desire or inclination that you may have to change? I don't feel any. And I think that's the nature of having younger advisors who are coming out of the program, something they're familiar with. And I don't, in fact, right on my desk while we're talking, I have a big button that says yes. And historically, when I was starting to be a leader, I was I don't like that idea. <laughs> Like, if it wasn't my idea, it wasn't a good idea, I think I may have had as a bad habit. And so I think it's much better to say, go explore that. Go out and tell us why and give mm. them the bandwidth and the delegation, the proper delegation, the resources to explore so that they come back and say, you know what, we do like Money Tree. Then they're going to be a more convicted user themselves. So either they'll they'll come back with a conclusion that gives them more buy into what you're already using or they'll come back and actually successfully persuade you Absolutely. that there's a I mean that's a skill Sell selling your idea is a skill they need to develop So can you tell us a little bit about your your own story how did you come to the advisory industry and running a billion dollar advisory firm in Columbia South Carolina well, when I got out of college, I majored in economics, and I went to work for an econometrics firm. And I realized after a couple of years that I did not want to sit in the back room with, you know, virtual eye shades and think deep thoughts and just work with myself. And so I actually went to work for my college in the admissions office for a year. And as a part of that, I met someone who was a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch who loved what he did. And he said, you should do this. And so I knocked on the door. I was living at the time in Alabama on the door of the local office. And they said, we're not hiring. And they kept saying that for about a year. Finally, that manager was fired. And when the new manager came in, he said, oh, we've had positions all along. They just didn't want to hire any women. <laughs> and so. And what, what, when was this? What year was this again? This would have been 1983. Okay. And so I tried and I went through the process to be hired. And at one point in time, and you will laugh because you know me, one of the assessments on my sales mock game was that I was too aggressive for a woman, and <laughs> <laughs> which is not so a you, word you, that people normally associate with me. <laughs> so but I, I mean, even just trying to pair this together, like you, 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 you couldn't get hired initially as a woman ostensibly for some kind of stereotype that you wouldn't be aggressive enough at sales right. to get the job yeah. done. And then you went through a sales assessment that said you were too aggressive. Exactly right. So I went to work for them and, and just learned so much and had a great group of friends that entered the business with me. But about a year and a half into it, I began to realize I love the knowledge part of this. I don't like and I'm not very good at the sales part compared to my peers and began to scratch my head, and I went to an IAFP meeting in New Orleans, and a man named Harold Gouge that you may not know, Michael, spoke at that conference. He was from Dean Winter, and he said, in the future, everyone in this room would charge a fee for what they do, like a lawyer or a CPA, and commissions will be a thing of the past. And truly, the light bulb went off in my head, and I said, that, that's what I want to do. So I started taking my CFP, I quit my job at Merrill Lynch, and I went to work as a secretary. And I worked at a CPA firm for a while and a law firm for a while. And the reason I did that was there were no financial planning firms to go to work for that I knew of. I had written a note, I'd found them in an association book in the library and had written a note to join, and it came back you know, return to sender address he not found. NAFA happened to have moved in the time that I sent my letter. 
<laughs> and so I thought I was out there by myself, basically, because the people that I met at IFP would say, you know, in a kind way, girl, you won't be back next year if you're going that direction. And so I want to learn how to be, be a professional. Because, because you wanted to go in the fee direction. That's exactly and, right. And IAFP at the time was still very much That's a commissions. Right. And there wasn't. Transaction-based environment. Well, I guess like mid-1980s, there was still the, the heyday of real estate limited Absolutely. partnerships. And-, and they weren't being cruel. They were just being frank. And so I thought, well, I have to learn how to be a professional. I don't know how to do that. And it was wonderful because I learned what it was like to be on the administrative team, quote, of an organization and the power of that team and how to leverage the power of that team. I learned about confidentiality and how important, how critical that is. Nothing goes out of these four doors ever as a part of our cultural norms. So I learned so much from that experience. And then I was bartering. I would like, I had a lot of friends who were artists, so they would give me a painting for a financial plan. I got my MG engine rebuilt and the interior redone for a plan. So I would sort of, that was about what I was worth. I wasn't worth very much. I didn't know very much. And then I moved back home to Columbia. I knew. So Colum- I- Columbia, South Carolina was home for That's you. right. And I knew if I wanted to work and have children, I wasn't married, didn't have children, and I didn't have a job, <laughs> it would be yeah. good to have my parents nearby to help out. which they've graciously done throughout raising my daughter and starting a business. So I actually went to work for another organization in town for about eight years. And when they decided for a variety of reasons, we just were not a cultural fit. I made a decision to leave and start Abacus. So what, what was the, the work you were doing in town for eight years. Is that an, another? That was another, another fee only. advisory firm? Yeah, it was another J.E. Wilson Advisors. And James at that time was president of NAPFA, and he was also on the ICE, whatever the board of standards was at that time. Okay, so the, the IBCFP, the, the CFP board before it was exactly. CFP. Exactly. Very influential in the first stab at getting fee transparency, as we knew it then, fee only, written into the standards, didn't fly very far at that time. But he and Dick Wagner and many others put their energy behind that. Yeah. I guess, what what were you doing there? And then what ultimately led to a split? So I was a planner there. I was a partner there. And I just think culturally, we were not a good fit. We had high employee turnover for a lot of different reasons. You can have high employee turnover and be a wonderful organization. We all have lost people that still break our hearts, and we can see where we went wrong. Not a good culture fit. That firm really wanted to focus just on investment management. I enjoyed both. I like wearing both hats. And so just decided I would do my own thing. And at that point in time, I got off a space because I knew people would say to me, and they did, Oh, are you working out of your home? <laughs> and I wanted to be able to say, no, I have an office and here's my business card. We had some card tables and in the there. the business card has an address and you can point to the address. <laughs> exactly. It's not my home address. It's a real, it's a real office address. And, and not that working – now the whole cycle's come back to working from your home. But for me yeah. at that time as a woman, it was important to be able to say I'm a professional and having an office was a way to say that. So this is – early 1990s at this point? This is 98. It strikes me, you, 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 you left Merrill Lynch because you didn't enjoy the, you liked the planning, but didn't enjoy the sales and business development side. And then 10 years later, you end up going and starting a firm where you will be entirely and solely responsible for sales and business development. No one put it to me like that, Michael. <laughs> I don't yeah, think how, I, I mean, how does that how does that transformation come back? Because I, I feel like I, I see this more and more lately that for most folks that have been in the in the business for 20 plus years, there was kind of a dynamic that if you couldn't figure out sales and development and be decent at it, you, you probably didn't last very long. You didn't you didn't really last long enough to do other stuff and get planning oriented later. Now we have more and more people who come in because they're interested in the planning and they want to do the planning and they're not at all inclined towards sales and business development. And so they they take jobs in planning firms because they don't want to do sales and business development. And then I see a lot of folks start coming back 
after they've got five, ten years of experience under their belts and they want to go do sales and business development and start a firm. I think that's a fascinating observation. And I think what happens is during that five to ten years you're in development as advisor, that 10,000 hours of shoe leather we know it takes for mastery, you become a trusted advisor. And you exude that in everything that you do. So, yes, you may go out and do marketing and business development and ask for referrals, whatever your strategy is, and everyone's different. But that comes through. And so if you live in a town you grew up, you also have your first grade teacher calling you, you know, you have your mom and dad's neighbors. And so that all, you have a trusted advisor brand so that it's, you it's, can build it's, on. It's, it's just that level of, of building competency to the point that you become trustworthy. That means you can start getting clients. And when you start getting clients, you say, hey, maybe this business development thing isn't so bad after all. I think that's true. And I think, I mean, think of in your own lives – you want to get your lawn done or you want to have someone, you know, pick out a good physician. Everyone automatic you, you typically automatically understand who someone you can trust, someone who's authentic, and their brand in your community is oftentimes built on that. And you're going to want to wait for them. You're going to want to find them. And so it's a natural process that happens. When you made the the transition to go out on your own, did you have clients you brought with you at that point? Like you had clients as a partner with, with J.E. Wilson that, that came with you as you started Abacus? Or did you have to make a, a cold break, a clean break when you went out on your own? So that's an important ethical and legal question. And so I consulted my pastor and my husband, my family on the ethical side to think through that legal counsel. And so what we ended up doing was making a clean break, but we were allowed legally to let people know we were open. And then people made the choice to come to us. So I had about so you $3 didn't, million. You didn't dollars. solicit them, but you accepted right. the ones who followed that's you. That's exactly right. So I had about, within six months, about $30 million, which, you know, that's a lovely base to start with. Yeah. It pays that's the a, rent. It paid yeah. the first employee. And it gave me a base to build. And then this may sound strange, but the dot-com bubble came not long after that. Yeah, you, you started in 98. Yeah. That was and unfortunate just, timing in retrospect. Well, no, it's great timing. I had two, So I will say this. I think crises are good for us because people just fell in the door, right? Because people who've been doing – put me out of my misery yesterday and – I, you know, we couldn't handle the volume. I think we added 24 clients that year, which was just insane for the small organization we were. And the good news is we changed a lot of what we did because we realized what's really valuable to the client. What do we need to stop doing? We need to do that. And we need to ask ourselves that here more often. And then the other evolution of the firm in 2007, my husband quit his job as an architect to start his own firm. And I was like, oh, wow, Miss Feminist now has to be the breadwinner. Wait a minute. This has just been fun, a party, a good time. <laughs> and I was like, but I wanted him to do what he wanted to do. And he's much more risk averse. So I didn't want him to see any of the whites of my eyes while he was going through it. He's turned out to be fabulously successful in his own profession. And then not long after that, you know, the Great Recession came. And my husband said to me at the time when I was whining, he said, Every time you go through one of these phases, you get more clients than in good times. And I just think that's true. In good times, you have to work harder at business development, bringing in the inquiries. In, in difficult times, it's, it's like manna on the ground. So where, where do clients come from for you at this point? Like I... I right or wrong, I feel like there's a lot of discussion that it's hard to build big advisory firms unless you're in big metropolitan areas because big metropolitan areas have people with big piles of money and, and you know even healthy kind of mid, mid-sized cities struggle with the level of affluence and the more rural you get, the harder it gets. And, and you know, Columbia is a good-sized city, but you're, you're, 
you're not a, a, a giant metropolitan area the, the way that maybe Atlanta or DC or, or Boston are. Yet you're, you're bringing in three to four million dollar clients and have a few hundred of them. So I, I guess, A, I'm, I'm just wondering where, where do these clients come from? Like, how do you, how do you market and, and get these sorts of clients? And, and B, I mean, do you view that as different when you're, when you're doing it in Columbia, South Carolina, opposed to a, a larger metropolitan area? Well, I think there's no doubt that there's a high correlation between the size of the firms in our profession and where they're located, but there are always outliers. And I would say we have three benefits going for us. One is we have had some very dedicated centers of influence over the years to CPAs and to estate planning attorneys who have been very good to us and put us in front of very high net worth individuals. Second thing I would say is even though we're at a billion, the two top guys at Merrill Lynch and the top guy at the local Smith Barney are all at four billion. So there's more money to be had. Yeah. <laughs> and the next part, and so centers of influence, obviously existing clients have, if you can go back and look at, you know, there's, you're encouraged to draw the family tree of clients and you can go back and look at, you know, there are a handful of clients who have just been tremendous advocates of our organization. And so if you can get a few of those, they continue to be the gift that keeps on giving. And then finally, you know, my passion, I, I'm i passionate about volunteer work and particularly social justice and education. And so I'm on some national boards that give me proximity to individuals of wealth, too. That's not as sustainable because they're picking me in many cases, all they quickly adapt to being a client of the firm. And some of those clients, children who live in other cities have now become clients of our younger advisors. And so I'm not saying that won't be sustainable, but you always have to be somewhat region centric or have a fabulous virtual process touch to make that work. So how did oh, the... And, may, and Michael, oh. may I say one more thing I think is really important? I apologize. We also have another employee who's a tremendous gift to us, um, Eddie Kramer. Eddie came here out of Texas Tech. This is a beautiful story. As an intern, came to work with us for four years. And then, as often happens, with marriage and children, got the draw back to home in Texas and went back to work for USAA. Went to work for USAA. Called us back up after four years and said, you know what? I think I want to come back. And the beauty of that is he came back. He was always a natural salesman. I mean, listening to him on the phone or at a party, I just want to f drop dead on the floor and a swoon. He's so good at it. And so authentic and natural with all kinds of people. But that training that he got at USAA is something we could never have done. So that loss, his experience turned out to be a tremendous gift for us. So not only is he really good at business development, but he's really good at grooming other people and seeing their strengths and helping them build skills that are natural to them, not skills that aren't natural to them, including me. He does, he sits down with me and does my business development plan. So we've really begun to turn the corner of having a culture of business development because of his skill set and his leadership in that area. So sometimes a loss becomes a win in a strange ways. Interesting. Your COI relationships with attorneys and accountants, you know, I, I feel like that's a thing that people talk about a lot in the industry and a lot of advisors struggle to actually get any referrals from attorneys and accountants. So is, is there – like what what is it about those relationships that, that, that has worked for you or is there something that you just have, have found makes it work that other advisors aren't doing? Well, I – I can only speak for what we are doing, and uh, there are clearly dozens of attorneys and CPAs now who don't refer to us. And I think particularly on the CPA side, as the regional firms have developed their own in-house wealth management talent, we've seen that dry up. But for the smaller CPA firms and the smaller boutique estate planning firms, I think two things happen. One is we've known them a long time. We've always shown up to be doing the right thing for their clients and secondly, we have, because we go to the meeting, <laughs> they get to know how well the client knows us. They know we're there to translate. We're there to execute, not 
to help facilitate the best outcome. Same thing with the CPA annual strategy meeting. So because we do those extra meetings, we're learning how to be better on our side as planners by listening to experts in their area. We're solidifying the client gets the best advice, and we're also building in their brains the talent that we bring to bear at our organization. I think we get two or three, you know, multi-million dollar referrals from each of those for a year, and they almost always close because of that strong referral. So I just think it takes, what I would say is it takes a really long time. The other thing we do, and this is probably has no impact whatsoever, but we do take Girl Scouts cookies and milk to every CPA firm in town that we share clients with on March 15th, the corporate tax deadline. <laughs> You, t- you take Girl Scout cookies and milk to accounting firms on March corporate tax day, yes. March fifteenth, with a little note. Just, uh, just, to, just to build. <laughs> that's a our little, branding. That's your branding. <laughs> and then attorneys always get honey bells from Florida in January. You know, because they're exhausted from the December push. They're tired of Christmas, you know, candy, and so we have ways of branding ourselves with our different niches that we work with that they look forward to and it keeps us top of mind along with all the other things people do. But I just mentioned the Girl Scout cookies because I love it. I love that we help Girl Scouts. We're branding ourselves. Yeah. So you, you, you just mentioned some niches and I know you had, you had said earlier, you know, you've got a, a focus on families with shared assets. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about your know, niches, what you guys do with niches, how you, how you position yourself that way? I think that it two years ago, we sort of launched on a long-term strategic plan of how we were going to grow. Were we going to do mergers and acquisitions? Were we going to grow organically? Were we going to pick an ideal client? And we just decided out of a lot of reading and thinking and talking organizationally that we were going to finally, after Tracy Beck is my coach of many t- years, almost two decades, has been trying to get me to do this, I finally said, yes, I'm very hard. I'm very resistant to change sometimes. Even though one of our cultural norms is embrace change, that's mostly a reminder to myself. So we have (laughs) decided to focus on families with closely held businesses. That doesn't mean if someone calls us up and says, I'm a widow, we won't take them. But we're just very clear about where we're spending our resources and energy and developing expertise. And so how is that, how has that shaped what you do with the well, firm what or where you spend resources. Yeah. What was interesting is about 50% of our clients already fit into that category. Okay. So you kind of, you went with something where you already had a And we a realized we did. We also realized that because we, we call ourselves spiky generalists too, so because we have a CPAs, we have JDs, we can bring a lot of technical expertise to bear that was overkill for our smaller clients. And those team members were signaling that they were getting bored. And so now we kind of have a blue ocean strategy of there aren't many people serving closely held businesses the way they, that we do. Our team members who are devoted to mastery have new areas to master. And it marries our unique skills of technical expertise and soft skills. We put as much training into our emotional intelligence skills as we do our technical skills. And we think that's a unique combination, and it particularly serves situations where you have complexity on the technical side and complexity on the family system side, which might include ADHD, might include dementia, it might include, you know, multiple divorces. So how do you actually train empathy and listening skills? So we have for almost a decade had a wealth psychologist, Jim Grubman, who would come twice a year for two days of training. And active listening is one of the building blocks of a that. A wealth psychologist. Yes. Who can play you, Valentine? Can you expand on that a little? What's, yeah. uh, what's a With wealth psychologist? Dis- <laughs> so in full disclosure, Roy Valentine first began working with Dr. Grubman. He's a clinical psychologist by training, but he works specifically in areas of wealth. And so that might mean anything the basic of active listening. He and Roy developed the wonderful proper apology that's in the Journal of Financial Planning that I would highly recommend, which is just a basic skill set. But if all the errors that were made here 
and there are many, and they happen more routinely than any of us would like. If I'm the only person who can deliver an adequate apology, we won't ever make the distance. So it's those small skills that are part of active listening. We have a smart decision tree, so literally we have an algorithm that he taught us about how to help a client through a decision. They call up and they want to do something you know is not wise. I'm going to buy that third vacation home, or I'm going to I'm going to borrow against the house to send my second child to get his MBA. There's a process we coach them through that allows them to come to a better decision than they might have had we not gone through the process. We learned about how to help people negotiate among family members for job. We learned some basic skills like you're in a meeting and someone starts crying or gets upset. How do you tolerate your own anxiety level? That's a big skill. How do you tolerate your own anxiety in a situation that's high anxiety? One of the things that hit home to me on on that in particular, a woman named Amy Florian did a book mm-hmm. a couple of years mm-hmm. ago for advisors on on how to work with grieving clients. And the point she made in it, which I, I have to admit, I, I had done at least once I can recall in the past. You know, when you're when you're sitting across from a client that is upset and crying, resist the urge to offer them the tissue box because handing them the tissue box really effectively says to them, here's some tissues. I'm ready for you to be done crying now so we can get on with the meeting or I'm uncomfortable or whatever combination of it is, which I'll admit is definitely a struggle for for me. I, I'm not at all comfortable when clients get sort of that level of emotional and, and know in the past I've I've offered the tissue box and I'm like, oh yeah, I, I guess that is actually not not really very good for the letting the client have their space for for their for their grieving. Just like all those little things of being comfortable with clients when clients just need to express emotional upset that has been definitely a, a hefty personal learning curve for me to get through over the years. I think that's true for all of us, Michael. Some of us may have more natural skills, but we need to grow those and deepen our empathy and our skills to handle situations. And I I still am anxious and uncomfortable in those situations, but how do I manage myself so it's not, as you, Amy so beautifully puts it, disempowering or intruding improperly on the client? So you have Dr. Grubman coming down, you said to do two two-day trainings a year with your with your team? Yes. That's a lot of, I mean, that's, that's four days of not office productivity. Of, well, of, not everybody. I mean, that's said. like, that's a hefty, <laughs> invest- well, yeah, I, I understand. Like, I, I'm sure there are a couple of folks in, in investments and operations maybe that don't need to. Well, no, everybody does it, but okay. not everybody's in for the two days. So I might be okay. four hours. It's tiered. Right. Okay. Here for pushing uh, those with the most experience further into their discomfort zone of what they need to know and introducing those who are. But sure, you do assertiveness training with your operations people where they might get pushed around sometimes by clients and giving them the skill, the tool set for that is part of what we do. Interesting. So, so Dr. Grubman does these trainings for advisory firms. That's what he does, well, or is this part of what he does? sadly, that's what he did for a decade now. He's he's written a wonderful, several a wonderful books, Strangers in Paradise, which really put him in the forefront of multi-billion dollar families. And he's gone on to be a partner at Cambridge Research, where they exclusively work in that area. So he will not be okay. coming to train us anymore. But, oh, no. But Amy's a perfect example. Amy Florian is a perfect example of... If Amy came here and talked with us for a couple of days, the kinds of skills she's teaching you are exactly the kind of skills that you can adapt to other situations. So are you now actively looking for new new alternative trainers with Dr. Grubman moving on to Cambridge? Well, you know, Michael, I think that's one thing about being successful. You or Abacus can never be everything it needs to be. So we are always looking for, you know... Amy Florian, going to her seminars, you know, what you do. Tracy and I know Beckett's she's doing there. workshops now yeah, with she advisory is. firms. And I would highly recommend our Molly Thomas, who is our lead advisor in insurance, went to that and came back just blown away with what she learned. 
So we'll we'll make sure we put a link up to Amy Florian's training and programs as well in the show notes. So again, those who are listening, this is episode 35. So go to kitsis.com slash 35 and you can get links out for Amy Florian's training programs. So we've always had outside resources and I've, I mean, we have Tracy Beckus and I worked together for a long time. So she's helped us in strategy and our ideal client work. I found at a certain point in my journey that I was really good at basic work habits. I show up on time. I say thank you. I'm prepared. I do what I say when I say I'm going to do it. I was gifted to be a sort of natural leader, but I was terrible at management. And I really, you know, people were almost like guinea pigs and trying to learn what was the right thing to do. And so we had a management coach for quite a while and she helped us develop a lot of skills around what is proper delegation, what is proper feedback. And so we have these tools that we now use from wide, but that made me, I'm never going to be as gifted as a manager as many team members here are, but I'm better and I know what I should do. <laughs> and I sleep better at night because of that. <laughs> Do you just keep a like a, a hefty training budget as a line item on the abacus? Oh, sure. P and L statement for for doing all these different trainings for you and for team and. Absolutely. I'm I'm wondering like how how much do you budget for training across all these? Like I mean it's it's well it's, you put out a lot of stuff. Well, here's what I say: it's not every year that we do everything. So I think it's probably around twenty five thousand a year. Well, of of just. Yeah. Bring bringing folks in and 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 doing these kinds of trainings. Do you do you send folks out for conferences as well, or do you tend to bring these trainings in more than sending people out? Both. People have a development program, and oftentimes the development program will include going to a conference. And again, because the, the expectations they're bringing a lot back to the organization to move us forward. So, what is, what is a a typical day, or maybe it's better to say like a, a typical week, look like for you at, at at this point. I mean, like what what's your actual role in the firm? I know you when you started it, you you do everything because that's how it works. Now there's 24 people, and half of them are advisors, and 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 lots of folks around. It's like what what is an what does a typical week actually look like for you at this point? Well, I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, so I travel quite a bit between, I'm on three national boards. So those are board meetings I go to where I have an opportunity to see really great leaders at work. And that's a wonderful training ground for me as well as being able to do something for others. So I'm probably gone mm, a week out of every month. And then some of that's client travel and some of that's professional development in our own profession. And then when I'm here in the office, I will have client meetings. I still have clients for whom I am either the lead advisor or I'm a team mentor where I don't really do any of the work, but if they need a check-in and do some role play around a difficult situation or want to check in on strategy, I'm available for that. So I'll have client meetings. I do a lot of, I meet with all the leadership team one-on-one once a month. So we have a two-hour segment usually for their development and check-in, checking on their goals, feedback for me, feedback for them. I'm just all the time jettisoning things. So I don't, you know, human resources, the financial, the CFO team I don't sit on. I don't sit on the investment team or the financial planning team. So I really am working on business development, strategy, and then communication. I still do a lot of the writing for the organization. I love it. It's a way to help me think about what we're doing, do our newsletter still. It seems to be a good use of my time because it doesn't take me long and it keeps me energized. As these roles have evolved, you know, you, you kind of alluded to you've got a core cultural value around embracing change, but that's actually a challenge for you personally. Like how, you know, how have you made, like how do you manage through that. I mean that you you I can only imagine how many different role changes you've been through as the firm goes from just you to 24 people and 30 million to a billion. Like how how do you manage or nudge or force yourself into these into these changes? 
Well, I think we're all our own worst enemies. And so the qualities that are strengths are also hindrances sometimes I see in myself. Mm. And what I've learned to watch for is I hit a ceiling of complexity. I've just created so much chaos physically or for those around me that I, I realize I need to evolve and the organization probably needs me to evolve. And so I think that's sort of a signal to me. I enjoy learning new things. And so changing my role is always, the difficulty is going from high efficiency to low efficiency when you evolve into a new role. And then there's this gift around me that I know the people who are doing the technology, business development, leading the financial planning team, chief investment officer, are all so much better at that than I ever was when I wore that hat. So there's high energy for that. And I actually recently had a thought, I thought, well, I keep telling everyone I'm going to retire around 70 and if they want me to work here, I might be an employee. But you know, they may not offer me a job. (laughs) And so I I think there is a a drive, a, a joy in learning and mastery that keeps me going. There's also a high motivation for, I mean, I love this quote in Anna Karina Tolstoy says, to be happy in life, if you love the work you do and work for the ones you love, that's happiness. And I feel I have that and I'm mm. just blessed to have that. And so I, part of that for me is, you know, transitions for a firm aren't just the transaction of shares. You have to develop the leadership skills and then you have to have a new form of governance because governance of one is very different than governance of four or eight or 12, which we will be at in the near future. So there's a lot for me to master and learn and explore that will make the firm stronger and give everyone else here an opportunity for wealth creation, personal growth, personal fulfillment, however they see that. It's going to be different than I see it if I can accomplish those goals. So how do you know when one of those walls actually hit? Yeah. Does it just, yeah, life just literally gets overwhelmingly complex? You say, oh my gosh, something's got to change. Like, how, 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 do you, how do you know when you're actually at one of those transition points? I think there are two bellwethers for me and one for the firm. And I'll talk about the firm first. We do a 360 every year with our, one more person. So we do a 360. We outsource that to our corporate psychologist who has had the opportunity. He evaluates every employee we've ever hired. And so he knows them. He knows us. And then he does a 360 where everybody So 360 weighs review in. means you get, you get reviewed by everyone around you, the exactly. people on your level, the people above you, and the people below you. Exactly. Even reporting up about how you're doing. And you're we get I get rated on cultural norms and several leadership skills. And so if I get that report back and the f- critical comments make note of stre- my stress level, that is a signal to me that I'm we've had a ceiling of complexity. That I'm not seeing it but they are and they're not they're not comfortable saying it to me in real time is the real danger. Because usually they are able to say things to me in real time. But if they're not and it shows up on that report, I know we've hit a ceiling of complexity. And then personally, I think what I'll notice is I'm not having fun anymore. Like I'm not waking up going, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful. I can't wait to do this, that, and the other. And that shift away is a telltale sign for me that why am I doing this if it's not enjoyable? That's a pain point that I think you know, all of us get into at some point. You know, the the job or the business, the role evolves to the point that it's not fun anymore. You may, maybe it gets too complex. Maybe it gets too hard. Maybe there's too much growth or not enough growth. But you know, there's, I don't know, there's an interesting distinction I find that some people are just particularly good at saying, well, crap, I got to figure out whatever it is I got to do to change this mm-hmm. and make it fun again. Mm-hmm. And and others just seem to let themselves get stuck there. Because it's, it's so demotivating when it's not fun that it's hard to get excited about then creating the additional pain of change <laughs> to hope maybe it'll be fun again on the other end. That But but if you let yourself get stuck there, then then you get stuck. The business gets stuck and the, the, and the fun gets stuck. 
So is it like, are you just, I guess, going back to that wonderful Merrill Lynch assessment, you're, you're just naturally wired to be aggressive enough to push through those <laughs> challenge points that maybe some others get caught in? I think so. I, I guess I actually think the true answer is I'm a natural optimist. So I, I believe there's a better day tomorrow. And so that usually gets me through to the other side. There's got to be a better way. I just haven't read the right. And then I'll wander around with the problem in my head and then I'll read something and I'll go to conference and hear something or I'll listen to one of your podcasts. And I'll go, oh, there's, that's been staring me in the face. And now with great co-shareholders, I don't solve that problem alone anymore. I go to them. We talk together. So I expect to hit those ceilings again. And if I don't, then I am worried about myself because I'm not challenging myself enough. So where do you go for inspiration and ideas? Well, I love to read, and I love to read outside the profession. So what's what's on the night table now that you're reading? <laughs> well, I'm actually reading the, the book that just won the Pulitzer Prize about religion in China. Because I went there and came back. And so there's, that's completely outside the box of what we do every day. I'm rereading, as I do every year, two books. I always reread Trusted Advisor. Maybe not in detail, but I always go, ah, that, that's who we are. That's what we should be doing. The, the Trusted Advisor. Advisor? Is that Charlie Green's book? Uh, no, it's David Meister. But David Meister? Okay. And okay, then, the trusted yeah. advisor. We'll put a link to that in yeah. the in the show notes. And in parallel, I oftentimes reread high performing investment teams, which is one of the things that got us started on our establishing a tight culture. What's it called? High performing teams. High performing investment teams by Jamie high performing Mayer. investment teams. Jamie Ziegler and Fran Skinner have talked at a couple of conferences. Okay, it's a really good book. Of deeply researched on you know, what were the commonalities and culture among high-performing huh. management. Okay. And not our type of firms as much as you know, money management firms. Yeah. But Jamie and, and Fran will say good cultures are binary. You either hate them or you love them. An example mm. would be, you know, if you go to work for Vanguard, and I haven't worked there, but my sense would be they're low-cost Structure permeates their culture, and you're probably bringing your lunch to work. And when you go on the road, you're probably not staying at the peninsula. And that probably would fit many, many people's, you know, the way they live and the way they want to live. But if you're the kind of person who's more drawn to a different culture, a Wall Street banking firm, and you want to, you know, stay at the fancy hotel and have a fancy car, it's just a different culture. And you, you cross people in those cultures and they're going to be miserable even though they're equally talented. So I've come to understand that just because people don't like our culture doesn't mean they're not terrific talent. They just don't belong here. So as, as you look back on your career and the track and the, and the progression that you've had, any, any particular turning points to you of like, Here's one thing I think I did right that that got me on this good track. Do you find there are inflection points like that in the journey? Michael, that's a good question. I thought you were going to ask me my regrets as you were steering through that. There's so many of those. The right list is much shorter. <laughs> well, no, you can talk about regrets. You're, you're, <laughs> you seem to be an eternal optimist. I would just presume there there weren't any Thanks. regrets. It's like it's like Rick Kaler's. <laughs> episode on on financial advisor success like he, he doesn't have regrets he That's he true. just calls them afgos another freaking growth opportunity it's completely true i'm a hundred percent in sync with rick on that i think i have a passion for what we do and i haven't veered away from your holistic financial advisors there's been a lot of shiny opportunities along the way and sometimes i've reached out towards them but in general the focus has been unrelenting on we bring tremendous value to people's lives by being talented, holistic advisors. That relenting focus of getting better at it every day, being more effective as a business every day, developing myself and others every day to 
target those outcomes is, I think, where we've gone right. And, you know, I am struck, you, you, you'd mentioned it earlier, you know, you've kind of jumped both a gender fence and an age fence in building your career in financial services, starting out as a 20-something female in the industry. So for comments or words of wisdom, maybe for young women in their 20s and 30s today that are, are still facing some of those walls, because unfortunately, we still have a lot of those walls in our industry. Well, I guess one regret I do have is that I didn't, once I got to more of a position of power and opportunity, I didn't speak out as much as I had at one time. And I'm now speaking up and out more vigorously in situations where I realize I've been interrupted or spoken on top of, or my idea has been stolen, not for me, but to understand if I don't do that, it'll keep on happening. But I think I would, this is what I tell the young women in my office, and and of course the young men too, but for the young women, don't ever be afraid to invest in yourself. And by that, I mean, you have to do that at home too. So if that means investing in a house cleaner earlier than you think you can afford it so that you can put in a couple hours extra at the office, that's a much better outcome. I had a person who ran that's, errands that's for me. That's an interesting one. Investing in a housekeeper to clean the house so that you can put in more time at, at the firm? Well, or read or relax or whatever you want to do, spend it with your child. But I see it as an investment in yourself when you, you know, I've always had someone who's gas and wash my car, run all my errands. I mean, I like going grocery shopping because I love to cook, but I... I'm better off not doing that and all the things I want to do in my life. I'd rather read an extra book or take my daughter to ballet lessons when she was a ballerina all those years ago. So I think don't be afraid to invest in yourself. And that includes wardrobe. You know, always dress up for the job you want and spend money to do that. And I also think for young women, don't, you know, just create your own flexibility. If you are a powerhouse and we have so many young women who are, who are here and you are going to get your work done, it doesn't matter if you come in. I, for years, came in at 6 a.m. in the morning and left at 3. And as my daughter moved through the school system, I adjusted that schedule to her. And I always worked full time, but I worked it in strange ways so that my family could be the family it wanted to be. So I think those two things... You know, create your own flexibility and invest in yourself. And you're extraordinarily good at what you do. <laughs> and dress up for the job that yeah. you want. Well, you had mentioned earlier the Dress for Success book. <laughs> so I guess that, that, that really rubbed off I had the you, little huh? silk, you know, floppy tie and my navy blue IBM pumps. <laughs> so as we as we come to the end here... You know, this is a show about success, and and one of the things that we, you know, have long observed in 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 our guests is that well, success means very different things to different people, and and sometimes even different things to us at different stages of our life or different stages of the business. And so, as you look at it from here in this firm with multiple employees, multiple owners, you know, and and you're building forward from here. How do you define success? When a team member comes up to my desk to share a story about a client's success, a difficult situation they were navigating together, an outcome they weren't expecting in a series of decisions they have to make, a happy family that had been arguing with one another, anything like that just brings so much joy for me. So seeing others thrive is so powerful. I enjoy ways of, as you have done so beautifully, Michael, accelerating the professionalization of our industry. So I'm writing more. I had an opportunity to write some an article for the Journal of Financial Planning on stages of change, and I want to do more of that where we have unique that crossover again between technical and soft skills that we can bring to bear for others to use. So that brings me, that gives me a sense of success. Learning and sharing always has. So I think others, people thriving and the continued opportunity to, to learn and share learning. Those are, those are, and happiness 
in my family with my husband, my daughter, my parents, my in-laws, that those are all things that my community, those are all feel very much pieces of success to me, and I feel blessed to have those. Well, amen. Well, I'm, I'm glad it's been a good, optimistic, aggressive journey for you to, <laughs> to get you to that, that place and really appreciate you joining us here on the podcast to share it. Well, Michael, thank you. And, and let me underscore it. My professional expertise has been enhanced. My entire team has by what you've done with your own skill set. So please keep up the podcast, keep up your technical writing, all that you're doing with XY, those are just amazing businesses and they make a big difference for our communities and our businesses. And I'm personally grateful and appreciative. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And, and thank you again so much for joining us, Cheryl. You're welcome. See you at a conference. See you at a conference soon. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the member section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.